Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Thank you for watching. One of my favorite topics, anybody who knows me, is actually stool. And I know that sounds kind of strange, but you can learn a lot from people's stools. They now have toilets that are analyzing people's stools, and eventually it'll be where your urine will get analyzed, your stool will get analyzed. And anybody who researches stool, they will know that even stool implants, they do stool implants, and I've volunteered to give my stool to various people. But no, they've actually had Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis when they've done a stool implant. Like in other words, they, they put somebody else's stool in that person and just by having good stool with all the good bacteria and then changing the flora of the person, really severe conditions have resolved like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And then also, most people don't realize like your stool should be the consistency of a banana. Anybody who has a very ripe banana, like a ripe banana, not a moldy banana or a non-ripe banana, it's a certain size and we all know that when you have a bowel movement, you should be in the squatting position. So that's why products like squatty potty are so good you know you get a squatty potty it goes around you and then when you go up like that the way your rectum is the stool comes out much easier so a uh, stool should come out very easy so if you are constipated and you are pushing out these pellets you know there's a lot of problems because you, that means you don't have enough fiber enough bulk or enough hydration in your stool so whenever I have birthdays or Christmas, my friends end up getting me things like flush and frenzy. So I mean, if, you, if you've had parties recently and they're getting kind of dull and you want something different to do, this is an amazing game to play flush and frenzy. And it says, the third thing in regard to the game, it says grab the poop first to win points. And yeah, it can, it can add a lot to your life. And the reason why I even started this talk with this, because we're going to talk about the sphincters. And the sphincters in your body control a lot of things, and they're under the neurologic guidance of the vagus nerve. The uh, vagus nerve runs in the carotid sheath, so this is a model, and this represents the carotid sheath. The carotid sheath runs right on the anterior a border of the vertebrae, the cervical vertebrae. So when you have anterolysis or one of the vertebrae is forward because of cervical instability from injury of the posterior ligament complex and it can start encroaching on the carotid sheath and it can start blocking vagus impulses. And when vagus impulses, vagus signals, vagus nerve signals to the stomach stop, you get things such as low hydrochloric acid, gastroparesis, and when the vagus nerve input gets decreased to the intestines, you, the tight junctions in the intestines aren't tight anymore and you get leaky gut, right? A lot of you get diagnosed by your alternative medicine providers for leaky gut and you are allergic to everything. Well, it might be that the cause of it isn't bad eating or stress in your life. You may actually have structural leaky gut from cervical instability, breakdown of the cervical curve, causing increased intestinal permeability, and then you develop all the food sensitivities. Cervical vagopathy can cause immune dysregulation. You guys get diagnosed with high sed rate, high tumor necrosis factor, and other inflammatory markers and some of you have gotten uh, treatment for mold, for yeast, for Lyme disease, for chemical sensitivity, uh, uh, food sensitivity, and it's helped, but if it doesn't resolve it, you really gotta think about maybe you have cervical vagopathy and you need an analysis for cervical instability. So this has a lot of different information on it, but if your vagus signals are not getting through because you have a problem in your neck, it's going to cause a lot of different problems in the digestive tract. The alternative medicine providers do a great job of 
doing stool analysis, doing hydrogen breath tests and different things to diagnose that you have a ton of bacteria in your small intestine. So what's supposed to happen when your digestive tract is working correctly is you eat food and if there's bad bacteria in the food, then your stomach acid is supposed to kill it. Like you're not supposed to get bacteria from your food that gets through your stomach into your small intestine. So if you have low vagal tone, you have a, some of the signals of the vagus nerve are getting blocked, then the vagus nerve is the neurologic input in your stomach to give you stomach acid. So one of the reasons that you might have low stomach acid is cervical vagopathy. If you don't have the normal amount of stomach acid, what's gonna happen? Food's gonna sit in your stomach, you're gonna get nauseated, you're gonna get bloated. If there's bad bacteria, there's parasites in your food, it's gonna make its way to the small intestine and then you're gonna get small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Also, the vagus nerve is what gives contractility to the digestive tract. It's the electricity, if you will. It's the electricity to your stomach, to your liver, to your pancreas, to your gallbladder, to your small intestine, your large intestine. So if you've been diagnosed with dysmotility and food just sits there, you probably have low vagal tone. Then your ileocecal valve is the valve between your small intestine and your large intestine. So the large intestine is where stool forms, like that's basically where your stool forms, and it has a lot of bacteria in it. And many of those bacteria are bacteria that help us. They live with us. They make vitamin K, they help digest the food, they make some B vitamins. And then of course, if you have low stomach acid and bad bacteria or parasites are getting into the system, then those bacteria and those parasites normally live in the large intestine. It's the ileocecal valve that stops them from going into the small intestine. So if your neurologic input into the ileocecal valve is not there because the vagal impulses are getting blocked, well, guess what's gonna happen? The bad bacteria in the large intestine go into the small intestine, and then you get diagnosed with SIBO. Now the treatment for SIBO, as you guys know, it's various herbal things, it's various antibiotics sometimes. Sometimes it's antiparasitic drugs or herbs. And I'm just telling you, if you haven't responded to that, you have to think about maybe you have a structural cause for your SIBO, that it's from your neck. The neck breaks down, the cervical curve breaks down, which we call cervical destructure here at Caring Medical. So the treatment then would be to improve your vagal tone by getting your curve corrected and then getting prolotherapy to stabilize your neck. The digestive sphincters are all controlled in large measure by the vagus nerve, the upper and lower esophageal sphincter. So you eat food, then the food is supposed to then go into your stomach and guess what? It's not supposed to be regurgitated back. So if it keeps getting regurgitated back, like you get like an acidy feeling, you get pressure in your esophagus, it's probably you have a vagus nerve issue and that's why the sphincter isn't working right. The pyloric valve keeps things in the stomach until they're digested good. When they're digested well, they call that the digested food, they call that the chyme. So the chyme then gets released into the small intestine by the pyloric valve opening. And then the small intestine's job primarily is to absorb the food. That's the job of the small intestine. The stomach digests the food, the small intestine is supposed to absorb the food. So if you've been diagnosed with pyloric stenosis, uh, SIBO, uh, pyloric valve dysfunction, you really should get an assessment for uh, cervical vagopathy because that can be the cause of it. We've had people who have needed dilation of their pyloric valve because of pyloric stenosis, but we just treat them you know, with prolotherapy, with curve correction, then they haven't needed as much or not at all the dilation of the pyloric valve. We've talked about the ileocecal valve sphincter of OD. So if you have 
a gallbladder problem that nobody can figure out or a liver problem or a pancreas problem. The sphincter of Odi is the sphincter that releases the bile into the small intestine. So again, if you're, you have fat malabsorption, you can't digest fats good, or there's some problem with fats, it probably is that your sphincter of OD isn't working correctly because the electric signal to it isn't right. And then the bile can't get released into the, the intestines, and it's the bile that helps us digest fat. The, so think about this. So say the, you, don't, you or somebody you know doesn't have good vagal tone, then the, uh, the tight junctions get separated. So now the blood and the body's getting exposed to substances that are supposed to stay in the digestive tract. What's gonna happen is you're gonna have unbelievable amounts of inflammation. So low vagal tone gives you inflammation. Then obviously if you have good vagal tone, it's the vagus nerve that resolves the inflammation. The body has what's called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory system, which is run by the vagus nerve. There's one vagus nerve on this side, one vagus nerve on that side, and, it go, and the vagus nerve innervates all the digestive tract, and then it also goes to the spleen, and it's through the vagus nerve and the electric impulses from the vagus nerve that helps the body resolve inflammation. So if you've been diagnosed with any kind of chronic inflammatory condition that nobody seems to be able to get at the root issue, you have to think about, could it be that I have a neck problem? So if you have chronic inflammation and you also have clicking, grinding, popping in your neck, dizziness, other signs and symptoms of cervical instability, pain, ear fullness, speech problems, voice changes, dizziness, lightheadedness, these kinds of things. We definitely see in the office here people who've been diagnosed with uh, chronic Lyme, you know, chronic inflammatory syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivity. I recently had a patient who they were having all these kind of bowel movements, bad bowel movements from Crohn's disease, and they said 90% of them were resolved by two prolotherapy sessions. So. When you stimulate the vagus nerve, there's various kind of vagus nerve stimulators out there, or you increase vagal tone, you increase your hormones, you then stimulate the neur neurons, the enteric nervous system in the digestive tract, and you stimulate the splenic sympathetic nerves. And what ultimately ends up happening is inflammation in your body is resolved.